I'm going to do a song to start because uh, everything comes from the land. So we're here in the land of the Algonquins, and uh, we need to remember that before there were the voices on Parliament Hill, before those construction workers came through here and made the canals, there were stories from the Algonquins here. And their stories came from the land, and uh, that's, if you can sit quietly out there on the land, you'll hear those stories. You'll hear them in the wind and in the water. Where we come from, our community is called Wasoxing. That's English, that's the anglicized version of our name, Wasoxing. And uh, we say it in the language, Waxayoxing. It's a, gl a glottal stop is one of our consonants. I remember when I started school, struggling with that, because I learned saying an apple is wrong. We were supposed to say an apple. <laughs> so an apple. Yeah, an uh, apple. <laughs> Made sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently it was an apple. So, <laughs> so I'm going to start with, with, with a song from my community, Wasoxing. And there's uh, three meanings behind that name. A long time ago when the people migrated from the East Coast to the head of Lake Superior, uh, Wasoxing was one place that they stopped at. And we say that they were on the Bruce Peninsula and they were stuck there for a while. So an elder woke up and he looked out at sunrise where he was going to go, where the people were going to go, and they say out of the water a giant mega shell came and the sun reflected off of its back. So that's why he said, Waxay Akasing, we've got to go over there, there's something shining in the distance. And then again, if you're ever in Georgian Bay, 30,000 islands, all those islands have birch trees on them. And that's what we say, it's a reflection of the birch trees on the water, is another way we say Waxay Akasing. And then there actually is a shining rock there that our people used to use for navigation as they came around um, near, near Perry Island. <clears throat> but this song is, is tied to where we come from. And we actually, it's our school song, uh, our, our on-reserve school, this is their song. And the picture is you, you imagine that you're in your canoe and it's early in the morning and the water's nice and flat. And there's still a little bit of mist on the water. But as you're moving along in this still water, you can look and you can see the reflection of the birch trees. And you can see the birch trees in the water. And that's what you imagine in this song. That's the picture with this song. So put your mind there when you're, when you're listening to this, where we come from. because I'm older, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I'm going to introduce myself. Um, I'm Wob's dad. <laughs> I was at um, a, a health conference in Toronto earlier on in the year, 
And no word of a lie. That's where Wob went to school. He went to Ryerson, eh? So I was walking in that vicinity. And this guy comes up to me and he's looking at me. You know what he says to me? Hi, are you Wob's dad? <laughs> <laughs> so that's who I am. <laughs> so I'm going to touch on uh, some stories here. I, I don't have one whole story to tell, but... Uh, to give you an idea of uh, how our storytelling impacts our people. Um, very often when we begin a story, we talk about the golden time. In a lot of our, our, our history as people, there were times when First Nations people messed up horribly. We did this on our own even before Europeans got here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and we did some pretty good jobs ourselves before you guys got here. <laughs> Anyways, what happened we, don't, we go in our storytelling that we always talk about that golden time. There was a time where everything was interconnected, everything fit together. Humans, animals, and plants. And we all served each other in an equal way. There was a great equality. Uh, there was no organism that wanted anything. Everything fit together, we talked about. So this talk about the golden time is where we always begin our storytellings, even if it's going to be a tragic story. But we always try to remember that there have been golden times and there will be another golden time. That's what, where, we, where we move through these times. So what we're going to talk about, or what I would like to talk about here, is what we call the duality, because that's important in what's happened in this modern history. And we go back to our creation story. In our understanding of things, for me, the creator is a man, because I see things as a man. For women, the creator is a woman because they th see things as a woman. And if pressured, we'll admit that she is a woman. <laughs> <laughs> because she is creation herself. The act of creating is the woman. So we talk about that. And we talk about the creator, in order to have this creation, had to accept that the duality was one of the things that may would make her creation work, amongst other things. So for the Anishinaabe people, what we understand was this duality was going to be a complementary duality. It was going to fit like this. One side needed the other side. It wasn't going to be a confrontational duality. It was going to be like this. If one side went missing, the other side would wither and die. It was how the duality was going to work. And our creator chose that duality that way. So that included what you see in our culture nowadays, this inclusivity that we have. We want to include people. We wonder when we meet a stranger how they're just like us. There's a little story about how we met the French, eh? We walked up and then we met the French said, bonjour. We said to the French, bonjour. <laughs> we thought we were saying the same thing. <laughs> yeah, a great Métis nation came out of that. <laughs> So, what happened then in our creation story, the creator used the duality as one of the strong, the complementary duality in this creation, that things would fit together. But we knew as a people, when our social structure came into being, um, Bob talked about the woman, and Anishinaabe people were matriarchal society. The woman is the center. The woman was the banker, right? Our economy was food. And the women were the ones, when the hunters brought the food in, sure, the women did all the hard work, eh? but they also divided out how the food went. We even say when the, the stuff was putting away and the food was putting away for uh, saving for later, it was the grandmothers who decided how it would be divided up. They were the ones. In fact, in that division, the very last portion of what had to be given out was called the grandmother's portion. And that was for them. But very often when starvation set in, the grandmothers always gave their food out. They in turn gave it back to the people. They wouldn't eat their own portion. So amongst our people, there was a strong understanding we had to look after our grandmothers. So we took care of what we ate. We made sure we didn't overeat so that the grandmothers never had to make that choice to give up their food. So it was a really strong understanding about, about the women and their role in our culture. 
In fact, there are stories that what happened here, when the Europeans first came here, some of their first comments about our women were, the women are too strong here. <laughs> they made those comments. And in fact, as a man, there's a story about men, they say in the Shnabe men, our courage left us. They say it's gone to live in a mountain in the north. Someday we'll go back and reclaim that courage. I believe some of that courage is being able to stand beside a woman like that. <laughs> a woman who is, speaks with conviction, who can be firm and, and speak for the future. At one time our men could stand beside that. We're not quite so much like that anymore. What happened to us is this machismo came, eh? This concept that man was the king of the castle. The concept that man owned his woman and his children. They became chattels, eh? This English common law told us that women belong to us. You have to understand after generations of women being the center and women being the leaders and women being the boss, how intoxicating that concept was. And we actually say that, you know, that machismo, the belief that man now is the top of creation, was very intoxicating. And you'll hear in, in, in the destruction of our, of our social structure how that um, was an intoxicant, as intoxicating as alcohol or drugs. And you still see segments of that. You'll hear how it's filtered into some of our, our understandings right now. We, we still haven't quite remembered that women are the center. We still haven't quite accepted that yet. Originally, these women were leaders. Men, we were the speakers. And we were given the authority to speak. We were given that by the women. When the Europeans first met us, the men did all the talking. The women looked like they didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> they were listening to what we had to say. My grandmother told me a story about when the Robinson-Huron Treaty was signed. The men of Wasoxink were summoned to go to uh, the peninsula near Penetang. Before they left, the women said to them, you just go and listen, then come back and tell us what they said. The men did that the first time. They went, they listened to what Robinson had to say, they came back and talked to the women. And the women listened, and they said, okay, now we've heard, you go back and you say this, and you listen to what they're going to say. They say the second time the men, back, men went back, that was when they got drunk and signed the treaty. So the women in Wasoxing have been mad at us men ever since. <laughs> <laughs> if you marry a woman from Wasoxing, expect a hard life. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so that was the, the, the role of women was very strong. And we have that understanding, even this residential school experience. How did they make our women weak? They took their children away. You take a woman's child away, she loses her reason to live. She loses her future. She loses her identity in her children. So that's what happened when their children were taken away. They weakened our women. So much so that our women felt lower, worthless. And what happened here on, in, in Turtle Island at one time, the women were the pinnacle of our society. The women were at the apex of our culture. And they were held there in high regard by everything. Not too long ago, maybe in the 1960s, before the birth of the feminist movement, you could say that if there was a strata of Canadian society and you were hanging on to the bottom rung of a ladder, and you couldn't hold on anymore, and you fell down into the lowest of the lowest of Canadian strata, it was Aboriginal women who were there. That's how far they had fallen in terms of where they were at one time. So we talk about bringing them back, but um, as men, we can't elevate them. The elevation that they have came from the Creator. And we're doing things in terms of our storytelling, telling the creation story, telling things like that uh, to reinforce our beliefs in the creator and woman as the creator and that balance and the duality. Um, my community has been called, a, a, I, there's a word for it, a gunagarchy, a woman's leadership. We had a woman chief for 29 years. She was the second woman chief in Canada in Florida, Tobobbinong. 
and what happened in my community. Now, if you come into my community, many of the people working in the administration office are women. It's still like that. When I was a young man, my stepfather, we were driving by the band office, and that's what he said to me. If you work in there, he says, you're doing a woman's work. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be disappointed in me right now, because I do have an office job. Eh? <laughs> So with the women being the center of the home and the family rotating around her with the, the partner, the children, the grandparents, the brothers and sisters, his aunts and uncles, that was, that was the circle for our families. And the destruction came when the men forgot where they sat in that, when women and their confidence in themselves as creators was undermined and their children were taken away. That was, that was very difficult for our women. And then we talk about things. Personally, since I went to grade four in town school, I've been talking about me as an Indian person. I've been doing cross-cultural talks since <laughs> I was nine years old. And one time, not too long ago, I was asked that. Why don't you people let things go? Why are you always talking about the past? And then it occurred, it occurred to me, okay, there's something current I can talk about missing and murdered women. That's still happening, I said. Okay? That's not something from the past. So I started talking about that because our family has had that happen. I had a young sister. She was beautiful. She loved life. Okay? And that's, she came to school here. But one winter she stayed home, and that's what happened to her. Which, there was a party somewhere after the bar closed. and. Uh, People were going there. She missed her ride. So this guy said, I'll take you to that party. And as they were driving along, he made advances to her. And she told him no. So what he did then was he kicked her out of his car. He drove down the road a little bit. He came back and ran her over. Um, for me, that was a hard night because normally I would have been drinking. <laughs> and I felt bad that I wasn't there. Why did I go home early? And I was one of the first ones on the scene when the people who found her called, called and said, here she is. And my mother was up north. My older sister was getting married. So I had to call her and tell her this. Her daughter had been killed. It was a great sadness. It was very hard at that time. But what happened, and this was 36 years ago, what happened at that time, the court system, the justice system, basically deemed it a manslaughter. The man who ran my sister down got two years. That was the value of her life, you know. And she was worth a lot more than that. So we talk about the missing and murdered women. So that was one thing that was in my heart that created a rage for a long time. But that's things we need to talk about. What, what is, what is now, residential school survivors. They need to be elevated and spoken of and sung about as much as we sing about our war veterans. They've had such lives. They need these songs to help them feel comfortable again in this lifetime. So in my family, we talk about, about this directly, this, what's happened to one of, our, one of our women. But I'm going to turn it over to my son now who's written a book. Um, I didn't coach him on this book. <laughs> he wrote this book on his own. <laughs> In fact, one time I was going to be a writer, eh? Because everybody says, John, you're a good storyteller, you should write. Then I read my son's book, I thought, no. <laughs> I'll read. <laughs> so, just a little bit, I can tell you some stories about him, because I'm his dad, eh? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> As a way of introducing him. <laughs> I, I have two stories. I came home from work one day when he was six years old. I walked in the living room and I heard his voice say, Hey, Dad, that's really bad about those earthquakes down in Mexico, eh? I said, Yeah, son, that's pretty bad. Then it occurred to me, Why is my son asking me that question? So I turned and I looked, and there's this little wee guy sitting behind the Toronto Star. <laughs> <laughs> The paper was bigger than him, and he was reading it. <laughs> but not only was he reading it, he was commenting on the current events. 
And then another story about him that I want to share with you because he was raised in two worlds. He was raised, uh, he's fasted as a child, he's been in sweat lodges as a child, he has his name. He has his Nishnabe name that he uses as you know, on his um, everywhere. Me, I still have John, I still have my slave name. <laughs> <laughs> My Ojibwe name is Zagasage, it means a sun ray. Um, I'm not brave enough to use that like the way Wab uses his name. I'm just kidding. But anyway, this other story I have for him. He was young, I can't remember how old he was, but he was already in, in, in public school. He came home one night and he was mad at me. <laughs> he walks and he says, geez, Dad, I says, what? You never told me about the Bering Strait. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere at school that day, he was taught about the Bering Strait theory, and he was mad about that, that he had never heard it in his childhood. Eh? <laughs> so I looked at him, I said, well, son, that's not our story. <laughs> <laughs> so he's part of a great movement right now, uh, his generation, storytellers that are coming, and they're writing books, and they're telling stories. For me, being a storyteller, sometimes if someone does something to me that might offend me, be careful, because I'm going to turn that into a story. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so I'm going to turn it over to him now to talk about his, his latest book and maybe other things he'd like to talk about. Oh, miigwech. Okay. Miigwech, Ndere. Thanks, Dad. Um, I just want to say miigwech to uh, our elders, uh, to Ed and the rest of the organizers for inviting us, and uh, to Bob for sharing such a powerful uh, discussion earlier. Really appreciate that. And to all of you, of course, for coming tonight. Um, to mention the notoriety of my name, um, if you think that's bad, just be happy that I'm not Wab Canoe famous, because that, <laughs> that guy has to sign moccasins basically everywhere he goes. So. <laughs> Anyway, it's a huge honor for me to be here tonight and to uh, talk a little bit about storytelling. Um, it's, it's a real honor also to, to share uh, this table with my dad, and I want to say miigwech to Ed for making that happen. Um, I talk a lot about my career and my journey, and um, I'm going to have to withhold some details now about my brutal childhood and how I had to like <laughs> chop a cord of wood and pile it before school every day and that kind of thing. <laughs> No, just kidding. Obviously, I had a, a really awesome, awesomely um, fortunate foundation laid for me uh, early on in my childhood, and I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm always going to be grateful for that. Um, in terms of um, being an author, a uh, funny story is um, uh, my first collection of, of short stories was called Midnight Swell Edge, and that was the first uh, book of fiction that I had published. <clears throat> and people ask me a lot um, about what uh, what if my fiction is based on reality or, or real life experiences? And, and I can't say that too, too much is. Like a, a lot of it is inspired by events and by experiences um, that I've had and that I've seen around me. But there's only one story that is um, pretty, ver it's loosely but also directly based on a, on a real life experience that happened in our community uh, back in the, in the mid 1980s. And this story is called Dust and it's about um, this community uh, in resistance that's standing up to um, I guess um, a colonial sort of attitude of exploiting the land, right? Of exploiting their land. And it's based on, on a protest that, I think the first protest that I was ever at in my life is when um, our community of Wasoxing stood up to these trucks that were taking sand from one of our sand pits, right? So I, I always thought that was a really um, key defining moment in our community um, and, and in my own life personally. And I always reflect fondly on that. But when I wrote that, I sort of, um, when I wrote the fiction version, it was more or less uh, dramatized and I guess sort of the, maybe a Hollywood version of what actually happened, right? So anyway, the, the, the protagonist uh, in that story, his father is part of the resistance and um, he ends up getting shot and killed at the end. So anyway, I had this book come out and, and my dad read it and then I came home uh, a little while after and he's like, so why'd you kill me off so soon? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, he was joking. He knew that was the fictionalized version, but uh, right then I realized, I was like, holy crap, everybody's going to be wondering who, who is who in all my books from now on, right? So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just want to talk a, a little bit about how I got to where I am and just share a couple of quick stories with you. Um, I know we're, we're winding down this evening's program, and I want to give you guys 
an opportunity to ask some questions of us too. Um, I'm glad uh, my dad came in and brought the drum and opened it up that way. He's, uh, he's a drum maker um, among, ev um, among many other hats that he wears. And uh, he taught uh, me and my brothers how to make drums as well. And it's, um, it's a, a gift that I'm very fortunate to have. But the drum wasn't always in our community. And I think my dad can fill in some blanks here as I'm telling this story. Um, I think after that moment of resistance that happened, uh, we started seeing a lot of the traditional ways come back into our community. Uh, it was more or less a renaissance, for lack of a better, better word. You know, we started having powwows again, and we started going into the sweat lodge, and I fasted for the first time and things like that. But um, we didn't have a powwow drum in our community, I don't think. And um, I don't know what the reason for that was. It was either uh, lost or stolen or destroyed. Um, you know, over the co course of the generations that led up to, to mine sort of coming into, um, coming of age back in the 1980s. But the first drum that I ever remember practicing on was a, a bass drum from a, like a rock drum kit that was turned on its side. <laughs> and the drumsticks we used were uh, like fishing rods that were sort of cut or tent poles and then foam taped around the end, right? So it was a pretty DIY, do-it-yourself kind of uh, drum circle to make. And I didn't really um, think at the time how, how poignant and how powerful that was. Um, there was this, this group of men and women in our community who were committed to bringing our culture back after years of, of feeling shame for it. And uh, for me, that was normal, learning how to sing these powwow songs on this makeshift drum, right? On this bass drum and using these fishing rod and tent pole drumsticks. But now when I look back, being a fan of like heavy metal and punk rock and that sort of do-it-yourself ethic, I think that's really badass that these guys did it that way. So <laughs> I think back and, and I'm really proud of, of having that experience in my life, you know, that these guys did what they could, like MacGyver, and, you know, brought the drum back to our community through, through whatever means necessary. So that's a pretty proud moment for me. And um, we, as I was growing up and learning about these ways, uh, what really... Um, uh, resonated with me uh, were the stories, were the traditional uh, tales about how things came to be, the trickster stories about the guy named Nanabush, um, stories about the language, teachings about how the drum came to our people and that kind of thing. And uh, that's really what made me proud to be Anishinaabe. Um, but as I was getting older, I didn't really see how, you know, that passion could really translate into anything else when I was really being influenced to, to go into my education and to, to eventually leave the community and, and study at university and that kind of thing. Um, but by the time I got to high school, I discovered another passion, and that was um, reading and writing, basically, uh, in creative fiction. And uh, English was always my favorite subject, um, but I never really saw how this traditional storytelling that I grew up with really could marry with uh, the literature that I was also falling in love with at the time because I never really saw that experience um, reflected in the written word at all. Uh, so, and there were two different, totally different storytelling experiences, right? Like when you're learning about your culture through the elders, you're sitting much like we are here today. <clears throat> it's a very communal, uh, very collective, very interactive experience. It's very entertaining. Um, you go on a, a roller coaster of emotions and you learn very, very important lessons. Uh, and you look up, you look up at the storyteller and you look at the people around you and that's how you experience that story and that's how it, it really sinks in and stays with you. But as I learned, learned how to read and, and appreciate books, I, I sort of understood that it was a really isolated and almost sort of solitary experience, right? You would be by yourself and just putting your face into this book and really letting your imagination sort of fill in the blanks for you and paint, paint that picture. Um, but again, I didn't see how, you know, that passion really could marry with my traditional um, upbringing and also how that could translate into, into any sort of career. So I got up to grade 12 uh, of high school and I was pretty clueless as to what I wanted to do in terms of an educational path. Uh, and then one day I was walking through the hall of Perry Sound High School and I saw this, this uh, poster up that said, have you ever thought of spending a year abroad, come to this information session tomorrow at lunch? So I went the next day and there's a member of the Rotary Club of Perry Sound there. And she was talking about their um, international student exchange program, which is basically how, you know, if you're a successful applicant, you'd go to a different country for a year, You'd spend time with a few different families, you'd go to school, you'd travel, you'd learn the language and the culture, et cetera, et cetera, right? And I still had my OAC year of high school to do, uh, so more or less I wanted another experience and to put that sort of big decision at bay. 
So I went home and told my parents about it, and they were pretty keen on it. Uh, and they thought it was a good idea. So with their support, um, we, we applied for it. And eventually, I was selected to go to northern Germany for a year. So in the, in the lead up to that, um, you know, I had these tapes of German that I barely listened to and these books that I barely opened because I was spending time with my friends and family in the months before I left because I was going to be away for a whole year. And then um, I think it was about a month before I, I was to fly out. And I got a call from this guy named um, Dave Dale, uh, who is the editor of uh, the North Bay Nugget which was in partnership with the Anishinaabek News, which is a newspaper published by the Union of Ontario Indians. So they service like our community and all the other uh, Anishinaabek communities, I guess in Northern Central and parts of Southern Ontario. And Dave said, uh, hey Wab, we, uh, we heard that you're going to Germany for a year. Um, how, you know, we've never heard of any of our Anishinaabek kids from our communities doing anything like this before. So how would you feel about uh, writing about your experiences over there and we'll publish them in the paper? And I said, yeah, that, that sounds like a really cool idea. Like, write, writing was my hobby at the time, and I loved writing about the things happening around me. So it sounded like a cool opportunity to get some really good experience. So I said, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm definitely up for that. And he said, every time we publish one, we'll pay you 100 bucks. So, so I was like, got the dollar signs in my eyes, right? I was like, ching, ching. You know, I, I had never realized up until that point that you could get paid to do writing in that way, right? I just never really been exposed to any other indigenous journalists who were really blazing trails at the time and making sure that our stories were documented effectively and, and strongly in, in mainstream media. I just had never been exposed to that up until that point. So I thought, okay, yeah, you can get paid to do this. Sure, you know, sign me up. So anyway, um, it came time to leave um, in August of 1996. And uh, shortly after I got there, I started school, like just within a week. And school had already been in session for a couple of days, but they just wanted to give me a little extra time to sort of get settled um, in the country and all that. So the day came to finally go to school, and uh, I was extremely nervous. I wasn't sure what I was getting into. I didn't know how German, the German high school experience would compare to the Canadian one. And, and just, you know, I, I barely knew any German. I didn't know how I would, I would fare with that uh, limited knowledge. And yeah, I just didn't know really what I was getting into. So my host sister drove me up to the front door of the school that day and um, you know my palms are so sweaty I was wiping them on my jeans I like couldn't stop moving and uh, as soon as she pulled up I noticed this great big group of kids in front of the school probably like three dozen or so and I couldn't really tell what they were doing because back in Perry Sound you know all the kids smoke in front of the front door right? <laughs> that's, that's, just where, that's the social sort of uh, hangout. Everybody smokes in front of the front door. But uh, I didn't see anybody smoking. I, didn't, I couldn't tell if they were like playing any games or anything like that. So I was like, OK, well, I guess I'll have to go through this gauntlet eventually. So I got out of the car, and I closed the door. And as soon as it clicked shut, they all turned around and, and locked eyes on me. And I, I thought, oh, OK, you know, I'm getting beat down. This is some kind of weird German initiation. <laughs> Probably get sent home, like, medevaced all the way back to Canada after this. And uh, So I was like, OK, all right, I may, may as well just get this over with. So I started walking towards the front door, and they all started walking towards me. And uh, I noticed as they got closer that they were, they were all smiling, and they were all really friendly. And they came up to me one at a time and introduced themselves in English and said, you know, welcome to our, our school, you must be WAB, we hope you have a good time here, et cetera, et cetera. And it was a really nice way of being, of being welcomed there. Um, and I found out uh, later on that um, the reason so many of them were there was because they heard that there was an Indian coming to their school. <laughs> so for a really long time, um, the, the popular culture German frame of reference for Indians is this character named Winnetou, who is um, uh, a character in, in books by a guy named Karl May. And uh, that's sort of what, I, I guess, the romantic, mystic view of, of Indians that a lot of Germans people, German people had. And I, I think this Karl May guy had actually never been to North America before. He just dreamed up this, this fantastic character Winnetou, right? So anyway, um, I, I went out for coffee with the guy who became my best buddy uh, not long after that. And uh, he said, you know what, Wob, I have to admit something to you. And I said, what? And he said, that day you showed up at school, we're actually really disappointed when we saw you. 
And I was, I was like, well, that's a weird thing to say. Why, why would you say that? He's like, well, you're wearing jeans and a t-shirt. We, we're expecting Winnetou. So he was half joking, but he was half serious too, right? So I had a good laugh about that. And that became the, the material for one of the first articles that I wrote back then. So I, I sent it back uh, via fax because these were the days before everybody had email, right? And um, the, the newspaper published my mailing address at the home I was staying at there. So I got a lot of feedback. A lot of people mailed me letters saying that they really enjoyed, you know, that article. And um, a lot of people from our communities would say, you know, Chmiigwech, thank you for go being over there and for representing us and for being an ambassador not only for Canada but for our, our nation as well. And also for, like, setting the record street over there. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Other people would, e would, would mail me and say, like, like non-Indigenous people would say, hey, you know, um, we actually didn't realize some of this stuff that you're bringing up. And uh, it's sort of this, this, this thing clicked in my head, and, and I sort of realized that there was a, a huge lack of awareness. Even though we come from a place that's a First Nation right beside a town, there's just, there was a huge lack of, of understanding and, and people just weren't aware of what some of the real issues were and what the culture really was and that kind of thing. And at the same time, I was meeting these German people who were genuinely, hugely enthusiastic to learn about my culture and to learn about who I was as an Ojibwe person. And I thought back and just remembered being in my own high school and n never really experiencing that same level of, of enthusiasm either. So as, as the year went on, I wrote more of those articles, and that's what inspired me to, to apply to journalism school um, when I came back to Canada. And I think when we talk about storytelling and reconciliation, um, it's really about speaking our truths and being genuine about who we are and being candid also about what some of our faults are and how our history really, um, as my dad mentioned, you know, we, we have our own faults, you know, we, we contributed in a lot of ways to some of our own problems, but at the same time, the rest of Canada doesn't know about that because the education system failed the rest of Canada by and large. And in very, very small ways, I think, and I don't think the media could ever be a, a viable alternative to the education system, but there is some makeup that has to happen and there's some damage control that has to happen too. And if we can do that in very, very small ways, just one story at a time, in the mainstream and independent and social media, then I think we will get to that place. So it, it's about taking some of those traditional stories and, and learning about them as, as modern, I guess you could say, storytellers and learning about who we are as, as Indigenous people and how we can stay true to ourselves in order to really speak the truths of the others throughout this country and what those experiences really are. And really br bridging those gaps, I think that's the theme of this whole weekend. Um, and walking that journey together in reconciliation. And it's, it's not about confronting what you don't know, it's about accepting what other people's experiences are. And I think it doesn't have to be, um, I guess, confrontational like that at all. It, it's about mutual understanding and respect. So I think that's, um, that's basically where I come from in my professional line of work anyway. And uh, I just wanna say chmiigwech again to you guys for inviting us and for coming out.